and we'll start shortly. Order, order. We start with questions, questions to the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology. Julie Marson. Okay. Good morning, Mr Speaker. May, with your permission, I take this uh, with question number 13. This Government has a fantastic track record at mobilising private investment in research and innovation alongside delivering the largest ever public spending, which will reach £20 billion a year next financial year. In November, the Global Investment Summit saw commitments of almost £30 billion to be invested in the UK, including the decision by flagship pioneering one of the world's leading life science investors to have its first international base in the UK. I thank my hon. Friend for that answer. Um, Hartford and Stortford lies at the heart of the Innovation Corridor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. private investment is very important to businesses in my constituency. Does he have any assessment of the likely impact of the Mansion House reforms on that trend and that great track record of private investment? Like its, uh, like its uh, Member of Parliament, Hartford and Stortford, is indeed innovative. Uh, the Mansion House reforms, which in my previous role I helped the Chancellor deliver, would unlock an estimated £50 billion of investment to scale up high-growth companies across the whole United Kingdom, including in the Honourable Lady's constituency. That sits aside our £250 million lifts initiative that will focus particularly for British pensioners investing in long-term growth opportunities in tech and the life sciences. When it comes to British innovation, this government is all in, and I hope in 24 financial institutions will do the same. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In October, the government announced the £60 million Regional Innovation Fund to boost university support for regional economic growth. Now, £3.4 million was allocated to Wales through the Barnet formula. However, disappointingly, there's no evidence of this money having been spent for its intended purpose in Wales. So what assistance can the Minister provide to encourage the Welsh Government to invest Wales's proportion of the Regional Innovation Fund on boosting the Welsh economy? Uh, well, the uh, recently announced Regional Innovation Fund, as the Honourable Member said, is providing £60 million in funding across the United Kingdom to harness the strength of our universities. It's intensely disappointing that the Labour Government in Wales uh, has not seen fit to spend that in the same way. Uh, ultimately, that is a decision for the Labour government, and I'm sure the electorate will hold them to account for that. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Private investment will need to ratchet up significantly if it's to offset the loss to the research sector that we're seeing as international student applications plummet as a result of government policy. What's the Minister and his colleagues doing to offset that decline in resources? <laughs> Uh, well, once again, it's an enormous shame, Mr Speaker, uh, that the Honourable Member for the wonderful cluster that is uh, Cambridgeshire is so keen to talk down the United Kingdom at every opportunity. Uh, this Government is mobilising more public funding for research and development than ever before, and we are mobilising private investment capital on the back of that £2 for every £1 that the Government is putting in. Jim Sheldon. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his response? Uh, I was talking to our minister yesterday in the voting lobbies. He referred to the workforce in Northern Ireland, how impressed he was by that. I am equally impressed as a Member of Parliament for Strangford. Can I ask the Minister this question? When it comes to uh, research and development in and across the United Kingdom, what is Northern Ireland getting to help our workforce grow, to help our people be trained and make us a very much integral part of this United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Uh, having uh, visited Northern Ireland before, I am aware of just how innovative, high skilled, and how much opportunity and headroom there is uh, in Northern Ireland. It is very important to me, as Science and Research Minister, that Northern Ireland punches above its weight. I would be delighted uh, to visit uh, Northern Ireland and to meet with businesses, entrepreneurs, and innovators there. James Wilde. Number two, please, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the 14th of December, I convened the UK's leading telecom providers to discuss the next steps to protect vulnerable households when providers upgrade phone lines. As a result, telecom providers have now signed a charter committing to concrete measures to protect vulnerable households. This is a positive step by industry to make sure that safety continues to be at the heart of the nationwide switchover. Well. I thank my rival friend for that answer. A concern for vulnerable people in North West Norfolk who rely on personal alarms and emergencies about the new digital network is loss of service and a power cut. So, will my rival friend ensure that those welcome new protections deliver robust backup plans in such circumstances and that they are clearly communicated to customers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I absolutely agree with my honourable friend that power resilience of our digital infrastructure network is absolutely key to keeping people connected. And as part of signing up to this voluntary charter, the main communication providers have promised to work towards providing more powerful backup solutions that go beyond Ofcom's minimum requirements. And I've had multiple conversations with Ofcom on this matter, and they are now consulting with the aim to further strengthen the UK's resilience in power cuts. Tony on Tony Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Rural connectivity remains a huge problem in my constituency of Goa. And as the, the Secretary of State has said, you know, the, 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 this, has been, this charter has been introduced. However, it was introduced over a year into the process when things had, had already gone wrong. What is she going to do to rectify that? Yeah, here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to correct the honourable member. This was a decision made by business to roll out uh, the PSTN network because of the problems with the existing copper lines and the fact that that too um, poses significant challenges. What we have done is taken proactive steps by convening industry to ensure that they are going further than their existing commitments, and we have involved the regulator at every step. Right, Eddie Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that welcome. And with your permission, I will take questions three, four, and nine together. Great digital connectivity is absolutely vital now to people's life chances, and we don't want rural areas to be left behind. That's why we're putting £2 billion into gigabit, so it's in every corner of the country. We're putting cash into satellites for the hardest to reach bits. We have a plan for mobile operators to get much better phone coverage for people. And of course, the best bit, we have a new rural connectivity champion in my honourable friend for Barrow and Furness to get the countryside connected. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm delighted to hear everything the Minister had to say, but I wondered what further advice she could give to a colleague keen to champion specific rural communities and the challenges they face with poor digital connectivity. Well, first of all, I want to reassure him that there is a lot of work going on on gigabit and mobile reception for rural areas. There is a regional procurement underway that covers his constituency and also a neighbouring one. But I would also recommend that uh, constituents elect great MPs who can hold me and be the UK to account in the surgeries we hold in Parliament. And they already have one in him. He is doing something right because Walsall North has 92% gigabit capable coverage, which is against a national average of 79%. And all I would say to Tamworth is take note. Well, Manson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right hon. Friend will be aware of the difficulty in securing a project gigabit contract for Lancashire. One signed the contract will help isolated premises and rural communities get a much-needed superfast connection. Last month, I spoke with Building Digital UK about progress on the procurement process. What steps is she taking to ensure that timescales do not slip and that we can see the installation underway for the second half of this year as currently planned? Well, I thank him for holding me to account in this, and I, I very much sh uh, share his sense of urgency. You know, his constituency has 86% gigabit capable coverage, so it's above the average. But uh, nonetheless, I understand the frustrations that people have when their, cover their premises is not covered. I want to reassure him that I've raised this with BDUK yesterday. I want to get going as fast as possible. We expect that procurement to be sorted in the, in the summer. Let me do it. Hey, honourable friend, back to her place. Um, she will know what's coming based on the multiple conversations she and I and her various different digital ministers over the years have had on the woeful delivery of rural broadband in particular in Scotland being the responsibility of the Scottish Government. The R100 scheme was supposed to bring faster internet to 60,000 properties across the north and north east by the end of 2021, but only delivered so far a little over 9,000 with a little over 50,000 still to go, with zero 
R100 North contract uh, delivery in the Banffshire and Buchan Coast constituency. So can I, can I ask my honourable friend what discussions she's had with the Scottish Government since she's come back uh, to uh, deal with the pause that was taken, that was implemented on the BDUK and Scottish Government. Uh, well, I appreciate his work on this area. He's a tremendous champion for his constituency. Uh, he will be aware that I spoke to the Scottish Government before I went on maternity leave. I asked for an update on, on that work while, yesterday when I spoke to BDUK. I understand that progress is happening. I am anxious to get that sorted because Scotland is missing out. It's getting behind other parts of the UK, and that's not good enough. And I want to help him to do everything he can to get this moving. Chris Elmore. Thank you, Speaker. I've raised with the Minister over and over again the village of Brinkethen in my Ogmore constituency, with three streets that don't have connectivity still. <coughs> BT Broadband have now come in to do the work, saying they will complete this work in 2026. This is just not acceptable. Can I ask the Minister to raise with BT Group again that this work needs to be rectified quickly and shouldn't take two years for three streets? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thank him. He will be aware that things are changing in Wales because the Welsh Government asked us to take some of the contracts in-house. That work is underway. Um, I'm happy to look at the specific issue with Openreach uh, on his behalf because I appreciate the frustrations of his constituents. And as I say, we have taken the Welsh Government contracts in-house because we think we will be better placed to deliver them. Alan Brown. Speaker, nothing can be more important for rural connectivity and connectivity for the emergency services. Does she agree with me it is a disgrace that the Emergency Services Network upgrade programme is seven years late and a budget now of over £11 billion is nearly ten times the original budget? Yeah. Aye, aye. Absolutely right to highlight the absolutely vital importance of making sure the emergency services network is up, robust, and running, particularly in rural areas. I'm not aware of the issues that he raises in particular uh, areas of his constituency. I will be happy to look into it. As far as I'm aware, we are on track on that programme. Hello, no, no. Morgan. No, I'm happy with you. Mr. Speaker, the shared rural network is key to improving mobile coverage in rural areas, but the, the maps that are used to produce the partial not spots are not reflective of the lived experience, certainly of my North Shropshire constituents. What will she do to improve the data that the companies use to decide where to put their improved services? Yeah. Uh, the Honourable Lady uh, raises an important issue. It's one that we have actually raised with Ofcom because we share that concern that the data is not good enough and it's not being reflected in uh, constituents' actual experiences. It's something that I am very alive to and want to get right. Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Science and Technology Framework is our clear plan for supporting innovation through our five critical technologies that underpin the future UK economy. We have already committed significant investment to these technologies, including £2.5 billion for quantum, £2 billion for engineering biology and £1 billion for semiconductors. We are also driving innovation through initiatives like regulatory sandboxes, focusing on future skills and establishing a new digital markets regime to promote more dynamic competition in digital markets. Uh, we have seen uh, in recent years that innovative technology can do so much to track down criminals, um, and we have seen the war of Ukraine, for instance, with drones. What some of us can't understand is why the French and us can't use innovative technology, more of it, to track down these criminal gangs who are herding people on beaches and putting them at risk, literally putting their life at risk. Why can't we devote more resources to actually catching these people with new technology? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my uh, gallant and honourable friend for uh, that question. I can uh, confirm that my colleagues in the Home Office are absolutely committed uh, to breaking the uh, business system of these callous uh, and illegal criminal gangs. And of course, a key part of that is technological innovation, and a range of technologies are being used in that. Secretary of State, Peter Carr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Businesses I speak to are excited about the innovation that AI offers, but deeply frustrated by government's uncertainty over regulation. The original white paper was delayed for a whole year. When it finally landed, ministers told Parliament that the response to the consultation would happen in 2023. We're now in 2024. Will businesses have to wait for an election before they are getting the certainty they need, or will she and the ministerial team commit to publishing it this month? 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, well, businesses have been absolutely clear when it's come to AI, that they want us to make sure that we understand uh, the risks um, and also the balance with opportunities uh, that AI uh, presents. And we've already, uh, we've already committed uh, to uh, publishing uh, the response in due course. Uh, SNP spokesperson, Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The proposed sale of the Rosalind Franklin Institute, um, a critical piece of national infrastructure, is hugely damaging to innovation in biomedical science. Now, I appreciate that the Science Minister is meeting with me later today to discuss this issue, but can the Minister explain how this um, sale sits with the UK Government's plans to be a science superpower? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I thank the, uh, the Honourable Lady for uh, that question. I understand my uh, colleague, the Science Minister, will be meeting with her, so I'm hopeful that she'll be able to address her concerns. And then we'll back. Please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Government has funded a broad package of AI skills initiatives through the education pipeline to address the skills gap and support citizens and businesses to take the wealth of advantages of AI technologies. And we funded a new AI master's conversion course and published draft guidance to help training providers develop business relevant AI skills training. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Defence AI strategy acknowledged an AI skills gap across the whole of defence and promised to work with industry to grow expertise in AI and develop a skills framework. This was two years ago. Where is it? Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the Honourable Member doesn't quite get grasp the magnitude of the amount of work that we've done on this agenda. We've invested $290 million since 2018. We've also recently just published guidance to support businesses to be able to adopt AI within their institutions, and we will continue to prioritise this area. To Greg Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just before Christmas, the EU institutions declared that they'd agreed a new EU AI Act. Can I ask the Secretary of State what assessment she's made of that yes. and how her intended approach in the UK differs? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the honourable, my honourable friend's work in this space. The EU have taken a slightly different tact to us because we want to be fostering innovation when it comes to AI. We want to be seizing the opportunities for our public services and our businesses and ensuring that the jobs are located here in the UK. And that is why we have our domestic ta- track, and we're coming back with our white paper shortly, but also why we have introduced an international track convening the entire world at the first ever Global AI Safety Summit, and it's something that we're certainly leading on. Shadow Minister Matt Rodder. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it is vital that Britain grasp the opportunity of AI, both to grow our economy and also to modernise vital public services. This relies on having a supply of highly trained staff. However, the government is failing in this area. Its AI scholarship scheme is floundering, with ministers finding only 21% of the funding they promised. So could I ask the Secretary of State why her department has failed and when she will authorise an urgent review into this vital area of policy? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Perhaps the Honourable Member missed my answer to the previous question, so I'll indulge him by repeating it by saying that since 2018 we have dedicated £290 to AI skills. That certainly doesn't sound like a government that is failing on that agenda. Richard Ford. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I'll take this answer with question 12. I hope the Honourable Member and his party will join me in celebrating just what a fantastic place the UK is for international researchers to work and live. We have one of the strongest science bases, the world's leading universities, research institutions, the largest ever public R&D budget, and with our association to Horizon from the beginning of the year, we are central to global research collaboration. Richard Ford. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Migration Advisory Committee will review the graduate immigration route this year. International research students are currently doing, who are currently doing PhDs in the UK they are attracted to work in the UK because of the ability to stay on and work after their PhD. Will the Minister engage with the Home Office to confirm that research students who arrive in the UK this year will continue to be entitled to a period of post-study work? 
Mr Speaker, in keeping the UK as an open and welcoming place to do international research, to deliver the Prime Minister's vision of being a science-based superpower, I and my colleagues regularly meet with the Home Office. But the facts, Mr Speaker, uh, belie his question. 41% of postgraduate research in the United Kingdom today is being conducted by researchers who have come here from overseas. Speaker. Uh, the government's recent spousal visa policy to increase the salary threshold is forcing academics and innovators to leave. I give the Minister the example of a British constituent of mine who is graduating from Oxford with his PhD funded by UKRI. His American wife, graduating from Bangor with a PhD, can't live with him because the job he's been offered will be paid well below the sal salary threshold. Can the Minister explain why is this government using taxpayer money to educate people to become highly qualified researchers if its immigration policy then forces them to leave. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, a fair immigration policy is absolutely part of uh, an open Britain. And it's right, it's right that those who are coming here from overseas uh, living cheek by jowl uh, with those who clean their labs, who drive their local buses, empty their bins, uh, make their fair share and contribution to the UK economy. I, uh, honourable friend, agree that one of the reasons. Sorry, Alan. Try again. Can... Please, when a member is going to ask a question, you should be seated or wait, Sir Oliver. My honourable friend, agree that one of the great strengths of us rejoining the Horizon programme and the other <coughs> European programme is that our expert uh, researchers, our top professors, will lead research teams which will attract researchers from right across the world, including, of course, the EU. And so that is one way in which we can retain researchers here. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my right hon. Friend makes an absolutely opposite point. And I would ask, Mr Speaker, all members of this House to go back to their constituencies, talk to local firms, local innovators, clusters and universities, and make sure that the UK absolutely punches above its weight within the Horizon programme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fight Home in my constituency is a fantastic independent researcher in agro of agropharmaceuticals. Um, I'd like to invite the Minister to come and visit them one day, but what more is he doing to ensure that we can attract the very best talent from around the world to life sciences, even in Cornwall? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, I would be delighted to visit the innovative uh, firm in her constituency. Uh, the Honourable Lady will know about the Global Talent Visa, which has seen a 76 per cent rise in visas issued over the last year alone, welcoming the world's best science, Britain's science, science and technology superpower. We come to Topicals, Peter Dowd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This year, my ministerial team and I will be laser focused on delivering by backing the science and tech businesses who are growing the economy, creating the new jobs, and improving the lives across our country. We want to make sure that British people have the skills that they need to take advantage of these jobs and also support the innovative startups that we see across our country to scale up here and stay in the UK. And we want to use regulation as a tool to innovate by de designing a transparent set of rules that encourage our entrepreneurs to be bold and ensure the British people truly feel the benefit. Thank you. Uh, in advance of the budget, what discussions has the Minister had with the Treasury regarding crucial funding for the development and uptake of human-specific technologies as opposed to the use of three million animals for experimentation and research in the UK? Sorry. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, the day cannot come quickly enough uh, that we are able to end the practice of animal testing. That day is, that, that day is not now, but this government, is, that, this, government, this government is committed to doing everything that it can to bring forward and support the development of replacement technologies, uh, and he has my commitment that we will do that at the right pace. David Dewey. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the Minister join me in congratulating Saxa Ford in obtaining its spaceport licence from the CEA? And does he agree that this site in Shetland will serve as a critical vertical launch site for not just the UK but for the rest of Europe and beyond, and is, as such is deserving of full UK government support? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Speaker. I congratulate Saxa Ford in achieving the necessary licences to pursue vertical launch from Scotland, uh, and I hope to see. 
I hope to see the success of that launch, uh, as well as rocket boosters under the UK space programme over the course of calendar 2024. Shadow Minister Christian. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A recent study has shown that through digitisation, UK small businesses can generate £77.3 billion in additional revenue and create 885,000 new jobs in this country. However, around four in ten small businesses do not view new technology to be relevant to their companies and do not see technical investment as offering good value for money. They cite a lack of skills and knowledge. What is being done to ensure small businesses are not left behind in the technological revolution? Thank you, Mr Speaker. We work very closely with the Department for Business and Trade on this agenda and also with the Department for Education and Skills in general. And also we have fantastic programmes like Innovate UK that are helping support businesses with their uptake of AI. And we just recently produced some additional guidance as well. Can I take this opportunity to welcome my friend the member for Arundel to one of the great offices of state. Thank the Secretary of State for her support for the science and technology superpower mission. Would she agree with me that as the Prime Minister plans a rightly robust response to the post office saga, there are important lessons about technology procurement that we need to learn to make sure that never again does Whitehall repeat this appalling misjustice? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You will see from the loud cheer just how popular the former minister was. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank him for his hard work and dedication to the science, innovation and technology agenda. He worked very hard on the science and technology framework, which he knows an um, important pillar of which is procurement. And I absolutely agree with the sentiments that he echoed. We come to questions the Prime